you very much indeed, and, and to my late arriving friends as well. Thank you, <laughs> just in time. Um, Clem, thank you. What, what none of you know is actually, Clemmy and I spent much of our 20s misbehaving together in Moscow. It's so lovely when somebody you sort of have a dissipated youth with re-emerges 20 years later in this incredibly prestigious role with Clem directing Pushkin House, and you get to work together. Right. Thank you very much for coming. Um, when people learn that I work on Russian art, they invariably think that I work on icons or the avant-garde. I'm sure that's not true of the wonder wondrously sort of educated audience tonight, but that is the standard image people have of Russian art. Now, what I do is proudly try and reclaim what happened in between. So I hope my opening slide of an icon and the avant-garde in the form of a Kandinsky demonstrates that something significant must have gone on in that period in between. Um, so the book, which is um, a year younger than my daughter, as she likes to remind me, she's nine. It took me a very long time, a year younger, because I started it straight after maternity leave. Um, what it wants to do is not just look at that period, not just write a history about that period, but also try and bring Russia in from the margins. So Western art history consistently thinks of Russia, apart from that fantastic avant-garde period, um, but certainly prior to that, they think of Russia as somehow sort of on the outskirts, this sort of little peripheral thing that was happening and which the rest of Europe didn't take very much notice of. And what I realized as I was working on the book, or what I suspected and what in some cases I, I'd already established, is that that really wasn't the case when the artists that I work on were active. So yes, Russia was relatively late in developing a sort of professional art scene. And yes, she was a long way away from some of the big artistic centers. But, but my figures, they traveled to Paris and Rome and London, and they met people who were influential on them, but also, just as importantly, who were incredibly impressed by what they were doing. So what I wanted to do in this book is bring, bring Russia sort of in from the cold in terms of this period and look at this incredible, vibrant dialogue that was going on between Russian and other artists at the time. So I take as my starting point tonight and I should say what I want to do, I'm afraid portraiture really got under my skin last year. So rather than try and cover too much, I'm going to largely focus on portraitists tonight because they illuminate some of the bigger questions that I explore in the book. And I take as my starting point a building where I've spent really far too much time, um, the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg, which was founded in 1757. Um, and it was given its first charter in 1764 by Catherine the Great, who also commissioned this fantastic building, which is still the Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Um, the continuity of the Academy's history is extraordinary. I mean, yes, it took on different shapes and forms, particularly in the early Soviet period, but this building has always housed Russia's premier art school. There's other art schools now that would contest that claim, but for me, it is still Russia's premier art school. So one of the delights of doing all the work I did in the archives in the academy is that you'd emerge from the library and get sort of knocked over by somebody rushing past you with a sculpture or with their portfolio of work, some modern, some contemporary young art student. So it has this real sense of vibrancy. It was, when it was founded, one of the most programmatic of the academies of art in Europe. It had its own boarding school, the only art academy in Europe to have its own boarding school, where students entered initially at the age of five or six. So they took them incredibly young, and they graduated when they were 21. So you, you gave your life, and so if you were a parent, you literally were expected to hand your child over to this institution. Um, any contact with families and home was discouraged. In some cases, it was totally forbidden. Uh, if you were a parent, you had to sign a document as you handed over your boy, because it was a boy at this period, um, saying that you wouldn't try and remove him before he'd finished his course of education. They were given uniforms to wear, which you can see um, these varied depending on the age of your child. So when they were, I think it was ages five to nine, they had one coloured uniform and then they moved on to another sort of uniform. This is for the slightly dapper, older student. Um, and I'm also wanting to introduce you to the interior, this interior of the academy shown here in the staircase. And the reason I chose this for the cover of the book is A, it's a lovely image, um, but it also speaks very eloquently of a lot of the themes I explore. So it's the art school, it's full of these casts of classical sculptures, which brings in this dimension of what were Russians looking at, what were they exploring, what were their models when they were first training as artists. And I love the fact here, you've got a sense of 
the kind of visitors who often came to the academy in the early days. And I love here, you've got this little chap looking at a canvas, an oval canvas that's being carried up the stairs. And I think there's a chance that he was a student at the academy. He's the right sort of age, and clearly he's engaging in the arts. Um, that canvas is almost certainly a portrait. So oval canvases are almost always portraits. And indeed, portraiture was one of the most significant art forms that was practiced in the academy. Amongst the very first cohort of students, um, by the time they chose to graduate, more had chosen to specialize in portraiture than in any other genre. And let's have a look at the sort of figures they produced. So foremost amongst them was this gentleman, Dmitry Levitsky. Uh, he was Ukrainian. One of the things I had to really tussle with in my book is that a lot of Russia's most significant artists were born Ukrainian. Um, and here we have to step away from the very keen politics between the two countries now. Uh, Ukraine, in the period I look at, was, um, well, in Catherine's reign, a large, large part of what we now see as an independent Ukraine was absorbed into the Russian Empire. And Ukrainians didn't have, um, the majority of Ukrainians in the 18th century didn't have a problem with that. So you could be proudly Ukrainian and part of the Imperial Russian Empire at the same time. Those things weren't distinct, they weren't at loggerheads. And Dmitry Levitsky epitomizes that. So he trained initially in Kiev, he was the son of an icon painter and a priest. And many of my early chaps actually were sons of icon painters. There's a strong lineage there. He moved to St. Petersburg, where initially he worked in forms of ceremonial and triumphal art. So when Catherine the Great was crowned, he produced some fantastic triumphal art, des uh, sorry, arch designs for her coronation. But in 1770, he really catapulted to the front of the artistic public's consciousness when he exhibited seven portraits at the annual exhibition of the Academy that year. Now this was quite something. These, these exhibitions were very new. There'd been very few of them. There wasn't um, a kind of cultured, regular exhibition going public at the time. So this was a, a sort of inchoate world. But Levitsky comes sort of bursting out of the starting blocks with seven portraits, which instantly attracted the attention of writers, of poets, even of playwrights who wrote about the sort of work he was producing. And one of those portraits was this one here, a portrait of Alexander Karkorinov. And the reason I've shown this is, or chosen this, is it demonstrates the fantastically um, sort of incestuous circles that these figures uh, worked in at this time. So Karkorinov is an architect, and he was the first Russian professor in any media or genre at the Academy of Arts. So the very first Russian to hold a position, a teaching position of eminence, was Karl Kordinov. All the others at this point, all the other teaching st staff wow. were foreign. So Russia still had this sense of not having the skills and the expertise that was home-bred, but needing to rely on foreign talent. Um, so Karl Kordinov begins to break the mold. Uh, he's, a, he's appointed professor of architecture. He's the first person ever to teach in Russian in the Academy. So until this point, all the teaching had been in French, and you get in these, you know, these ludicrous situations where you get young, sort of young Russian boys who don't come from elite backgrounds. So some of them come from peasant households, for example. Some of the sons of soldiers. They get to the academy. They have to be taught some sort of fast track in French in order to understand their French and later German professors. But all the time, the academy is trying to promote Russian talent. And so eventually, by the end of the century, you get instead Russian professors. By then, you get, I think quite comically, a French director of the institution who doesn't speak any Russian. So all of the documents which are now in Russian have to be translated into French for him. So there's this constant battle about what language they should be teaching in. But Karkorina teaches in Russian. He also is um, one of a member of a team who design the new building, the building I first introduced you to. And what Levitsky does very cleverly is emphasize these credentials by showing him in, you know, you, this, you don't wear this if you're teaching in an art school, even in the 18th century, you don't wear this. Um, he's wearing this very ceremonial garb that he'd had made specially for the inauguration of the new building. Um, he showed, by the way, it's meant to have cost about a year's salary. So he's, he's a bit of a peacock, this figure. Um, he's pointing at the plans of the academy building, 
which gives him some sense of ownership over them. In fact, uh, recent research has shown he probably didn't have anything as like a bigger role in designing the academy as people had previously thought. So this is a fabrication to emphasize that the academy is developing great young artists. And just to show you a detail, you can see how carefully that's laid out. The academy building's got an incredible circular courtyard, which is very prominent here. Um, and for this painting, Levitsky is made an academician, which is one of the elevated roles in the academy. So you get a slight sort of I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine thing going on here. He paints this up and, well no, he paints this established architect who's shown to have been performing and doing exactly the sort of thing the academy needs him to do. And Levitsky is rewarded for those efforts. But not all of these um, portraitists uh, managed quite so well in the early years. And as I mentioned, a very significant number of them were serfs. The one I'm introducing you to here is Ivan Argunov. So while Levitsky embodies the aims of the academy to produce a professional artist, a professional architect, to promote that, to show how well it's doing in annual exhibitions, somebody like Argunov works in a very different world. Um, he was a serf who belonged to the Sheremetev family, who, as I know some of you in this room have worked on the Sheremetevs, one of the wealthiest families in Russia at the time, and that meant one of the wealthiest families in Europe at the time. Um, they owned tens of thousands of serfs, amongst them many artists. And Argunov was from a family of artists and architects, a serf family of artists and architects who belonged to the Sheremetevs, and practiced their craft on the Sheremetyev estates in order to sort of boost the family's cultural profile. Um, he trained with a German artist who was living in St. Petersburg, and this I think is quite significant. These surf artists, well, it, it varies enormously, but in some cases, their owners invested a lot in their education, and they would send them to a very prominent society portraitist to learn their craft. So for Argunov, he trained with a German artist called George Brut. And he learned his trade extremely well, as portraits like this, his portrait of Boris Sheremetev of 1775, uh, demonstrates. It shows that he's working in the style that his German and French contemporaries would have been practicing at this time. But he also produces some far more unusual works in the form of his female portraits. Um, the first one I want to show you is a relatively little known but very remarkable painting, the portrait of the Kalmyk girl Anushka, or Anna. And this shows a ward of the Countess Varvara Sheremetova, a member of the Sheremetova family. Um, she, the Countess, has recently died, so her ward is showing her respect to her patroness in the form of this engraving. So this is a painting of Countess Sheremetova, reproduced here in a print, that was made into a print to be disseminated that's included in a painting. So it's a very sort of complex, multi-layered painting here. So there's a constellation of quite complex relationships at play. So at an obvious level, we've got a young girl paying tribute to a patron of much higher social standing uh, who's been recently deceased. Um, in this sense, it's a very respectful aesthetic experience. It's the sort of thing that the viewer would be expected to appreciate that this is an act of homage to her patroness. But I think there's ways in which this is problematized. I mean, one of them is that the ward, who's a, 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 from, as I mentioned, she's a Kalmyk girl, she is painted wearing the sort of costume that her adoptive home would have um, encouraged stroke, enforced her to wear. And it sits very uncomfortably against her dark skin. It's something which I think is immediately apparent to us today. So this is very much not her native dress. And at the same time, she's the one, she's the, the sort of more inferior partner, but she's the one who comes very much to the fore of our attention with this brilliant vermilion gown. So her beauty is very forcefully accentuated, while the Countess is really only present, as I say, via a print of a painting in a painting. So we, what we've got is the hierarchy between the patroness and her ward, very sort of unsettled by this painting. So one sidelined in monochrome, while the other one is brought vividly to life. By contrast, a decade later, Argonov focuses on native rather than European dress in his much more famous portrait of an unknown woman 
in Russian dress of 1784, a painting which I know many of you in the room will have seen. Now, the painter by now has been promoted in the Sheremetev household. He's been promoted to butler. This is a very significant promotion. It means he works now largely in one of the family St. Petersburg residences. He has very little time to paint, and that frustrates him. But he still shows that he's uh, very active, and there's a growing authority to his painting here, I think. Um, we've got a celebration here of Russian dress, stating the obvious, the ornate sarafan, the karkoshnik, so the sarafan here, the karkoshnik on her head, um, celebrated with quiet aplomb. And his attentiveness to the detail of this outfit is absolutely wonderful. The way in which he draws attention to the facture of the painting, the actual presence of the brush strokes, at the same time as he's trying to deceive our eyes by making us feel they're real, making us feel that they are tangible. There's a real sense of hapticity here that we could touch this costume. Um, with a pose that's typical of European portraiture, the painting transcends nationhood in many ways, but at the same time, this grounding in the Russian dress gives it an unmistakable Russian identity as well. Now, for all his success as an artist, and he was very successful, Argunov remained a serf all of his life. But there were other artists who managed to move out of that social category. Rokotov, uh, one of the great celebrated 18th century portraitists, um, he was uh, the son of a family who lived just outside Moscow, belonged to one of the Russian princes, but he acquired his freedom at a relatively young age. He moved to St. Petersburg and he was soon moving in very cultured and influential circles. We know this because in 1757, Mikhail Lomonosov, who founded Moscow University, wrote to Ivan Shuvalov, who was the founder of the Academy, and asked him to make sure Rokotov got access to the best possible paintings to copy. So there's a sense of him being given privileged access to the greatest that Russia could show. Um, we can see here the same year, um, sorry, three years later, he enters the Academy as a, stu as a student, and that year he paints his patron, Shuvalov, in this accomplished, if not tremendously exciting, painting. Um, so swift was his ascent that he was soon painting members of fast feeding members of the imperial family as well. And he's, he's getting, he's becoming a bit of a show off at this stage. If you look here at the ermine trim mantle that's tumbling out of this picture frame, you get a sense of how Rokotov is showing that he really has mastered these skills that are expected of a great portraitist at the time. Um, he, he was very successful in this showcasing of his skills because he became the only Russian artist to be allowed to paint Catherine the Great from life. He was given access to her just once. Sorry, this is going faster than I expect. Um, he was allowed to paint her. She was traveling in her southern domains down in the Ukraine, and he was given access for one sitting from life. From that sitting alone, he produced this, such an accomplished uh, profile view, that he was given permission to develop it into a full-scale work. Now, this is an amazing painting. Um, one of the things that's instantly striking is the fact that it is in profile view, which was unusual not just in Russia, but throughout state portraiture in this period. So largely you would have people facing the audience or more usually in three-quarter profile, whereas in this one she's looking right across. Um, one of the reasons for that is to emphasize the, the sort of grandeur of her and to draw comparisons with Roman emperors on coins. Another reason is that she was a passionate collector of cameos, um, the little sort of engraved stones which often showed people in profile as well. So this is alluding to her as a patroness of the arts as well as this supposed great classical um, heritage that she's, well she's not coming from that, but that she is emulating. There is exquisite brushwork um, around her face, around the, the, the jewels that are laced into her hair. Um, and one of the things to emphasize is this was painted in 1763. Now this woman, this woman who's not Russian and has absolutely no rightful claim to the Russian throne, has only been on it for a year at this stage. But my goodness me, she occupies it well, doesn't she? Um, so she seized the throne. Her husband, for those of you who might not know this, um, her husband, Peter III, came to power in 1762. 
Catherine by that stage had been married to him for, oh, I forget, 17 years, something like that, and decided he was a bit hopeless. I mean, it was a classic case of a woman falling out, deciding her husband's a bit hopeless, and that she can do the, do the job better. So very quickly into his reign, she gained the confidence and the support of the guards' regiments. She staged a coup against her husband. Um, he was usurped, and then most mysteriously, he died in a brawl with some gentlemen, including her lover, some days later. So she, she usurped her husband and almost certainly sanctioned his murder as well. And yet just a year later, I mean, to the man of born, it's as if she was never expected to do anything but sit on the Russian throne. Um, unsurprisingly, this became an incredibly successful and celebrated portrait. It was widely disseminated in copies, in engravings. It was used to produce miniatures, to produce cameos, brooches, you name it. So it was one of the most recognisable images of Catherine at the time. Now, in enjoying these very successful and independent careers, Argonov and Rokotov were far from typical among serf portraitists. Far more typical, though even he is pretty extraordinary, was the career of this man, Vasily Tropinin. Now, he was a serf who was sent by his master to St. Petersburg to learn various different trades. So not just to learn to be an artist, so that was one of the things his master expected him to do. So he was sent to study at the academy. At the same time, he had to train to be a pastry maker, maker and a confectioner. So you really were meant to multitask. You did, you did what you were told, and you acquired multiple skills, the, the sort of consummate multitasker. Um, one of the uh, rules in the academy was that if you were a sir, so they went through, the academy was always very, uh, it havered about whether or not to accept serfs as students. Sometimes it did. When it did, it required the serf's master to sign an affidavit saying that if the serf proved to be really good and graduated with the top honours, then he would be given his freedom. Now, unsurprisingly, most serf owners didn't honour that. Either they refused to sign the document in the first place, or, as was the case with Trapinin, when it became apparent he was doing pretty well and one of the professors went to his owner saying, right, we really need this document to be enforced, the serf owner thought, that nah, I'd quite like him back on my estate. So he removed him from the academy, took him back to his estate in Ukraine, where he did his pastry making for many, many years. And this was the sort of thing which was enormously distressing for serf artists, to be given these opportunities and this training, and then to be pulled back just as they were on the brink of possibly a successful artistic career. Extraordinarily, in Tropinin's case, he managed to carry on painting and he carried on improving. So he did the sort of routine commissions he got from his owner and his owner's mates. You'd, you'd have to paint portraits of all of your owner's family and then he'd rent you out to the neighbor and you'd have to paint portraits of all of the neighbor's family. And it must have been pretty maddening. Um, this was the sort of painting which sometimes ensued. So this is, in fact, the family he belonged to, the Markov family. Um, I love the gendering of this painting. You know, there's these glorious gentlemen. They're very dark and dignified and solemn. And then there's the ladies playing the piano and doing their sewing on the rest of it. And then the dog, who doesn't quite know where it belongs. It seems to be havering between the two. Um, but Tropinin also produced some works privately. So not to commission, not for the families that he belonged to, but for his circle, for his own world. And they include this very beautiful portrait of his son of 1818, possibly inspired by a portrait by Groes, the great French artist of this period, which was in the Hermitage at the time, and we know that Tropinin had visited the Hermitage when he was studying in St. Petersburg. In 1823, he finally got his freedom. So his master, after years of petitions from all sorts of people who admired Tropinin's painting, he finally sort of yielded to all of this and gave the artist his freedom. And that same year, the Academy made Tropinin an academician. So one of the other things I tried to do in my book, I, I so didn't expect this. Somewhere I've got the first um, plan I did for my book, and I know there's someone in the audience who I showed this to about 10 years ago, um, where it was going to be six chapters, and the first chapter was called Educators, and that was going to be about the Academy, and then that was going to be done. You know, I was going to say, this is what the Academy, that's what it did, and then I was going to move on to all the five other things, and each of the other five chapters, I remember, had a lovely single word title, and I'm slightly sad I didn't manage to stick to that. The problem was 
I realised that the academy had been sort of vilified in scholarship and I couldn't get rid of it. Through every aspect of Russian painting I wanted to look at, it kept sort of looming into view. Um, and one of the ways it loomed into view was as far more supportive of unorthodox artists than people have always thought. I say people have always thought, I think people at the time appreciated it, but in Soviet scholarship the academy was you know, the, the evil demon, it was the imperial institution that had to be vilified. But it was really supportive of some incredibly unusual artists who came from very sort of left field, um, came in very left field directions. And Trepinin was one of them. So we've got this serf who's been trained at the academy, removed by his master, allowed um, to paint, but only in very sort of strict ways. And yet in 1823, when he gets his freedom, the Academy immediately honours him with this very prestigious role. So the Academy is always kind of waiting, in his case, waiting, looking for an opportunity to give him some sort of elevated rank. Um, Tropinin responded with a kind of variation in his practice. So he moved away from the portraiture which had dominated until that point, and instead, he produces these sort of half-portrait, half-genre scenes, such as his very famous lace maker, this incredible attention to the detail of her activity. I, you're not really allowed to, to get to her without thinking about what she's doing first. And it's beautifully painted. If I move out the way, it's beautifully painted in these details. This is also true in later, less well-known works, of which my particular favorite is the Semstress in Novgorod, which I went to see, because I've seen a tiny black and white illustration of this in a book of about 1923, and I just thought I must see the real thing. I mean, this is an exquisite painting where you've got the artist with consummate skill bringing to life the details of her trade, the accoutrements of her trade, and this single white thread of paint that joins her lace to her lower right hand. It's quite remarkable painting. <coughs> Oh, sorry. Trepinin continued to intersperse a very thriving portrait practice in Moscow with much more intimate genre scenes or anonymous figure scenes for the rest of his life. And he did so with great success. He also did so with increasing ambition as a painter. And by that I mean he became much more adventurous in the way in which he used and applied paint. So in something like this, Peasant Whittling a Crutch of 1834, if you look close, the eyes are a sort of scumble of paint marks and brush strokes, which only resolve into some sort of identifiable facial features when suitable distance between the viewer and the painting is restored. Um, the background is left plain, there's very sort of scant differentiation in the contours and the folds of his dress. Um, portraits like these became particularly popular at the same time as the Imperial Porcelain Factory was exploring different, um, different sort of social and ethnic figures and types in figurines like these. And these are richly collected in the Hermitage, the Met, um, the some in the British Museum. So these were ways of celebrating, or ways of acknowledging and celebrating the diversity of the empire, of bringing many of her different ethnic types to the fore. And for Trepinin, this proved to be a very rich and lucrative vein to mine. He celebrated his hard-won success, and it was hard-won. This poor man had made thousands of cakes by the time he was eventually allowed to be just an artist. He'd been a pastry maker for donkey's years, and he celebrates his success in 1846 with this, I think, rightly proud self-portrait, um, intimating his new status in Russia's ancient capital city by including, of course, the Kremlin in the background. And the Academy continued to exhibit his work. So again, along with other episodes that I explore in the book, debunking this standard narrative which saw the Academy as moribund, as, um, you know, sort of as establishment, as anti-progress, and instead seeing it as something which was quite happy to support pretty innovative artistic careers. Now, despite that little shout in defense of the Academy, in the reign of Nicholas I, it became a very troubled institution. Um, so Nicholas, as I'm sure most of you know, comes to the throne in very troubled circumstances. Um, the throne was meant to pass from when his, when his older brother Alexander I died. The heir is his, Nicholas is 
older brother Constantine, but Constantine doesn't want to ta take the throne. Instead, it passes to the next brother down, Nicholas. This is not made clear to the general population, and there are also sort of murmurings of dissent about, well, many things, but one was what sort of ruler he would be. And in 1825, when the troops are meant to swear an oath of allegiance to Nicholas, instead, um, masterminded by a very small group of elite officers, some of them refused to take that oath. And this is what's called the revolt of the Decemberists, or the Decemberist revolt. Um, he has that brutally suppressed, and it haunts him throughout his reign. The fact that the moment he comes to the throne, there are people who are trying to take him off it again. Now, in fact, there's so much scholarship that makes sure we don't think about him in just this black and white terms. There's all sorts of things which did flourish in his reign. But as far as the arts are concerned, famously he personally censored Pushkin's writing. In terms of the visual arts, he was unbelievably meddlesome in the academy. He couldn't leave the poor place alone. So he took over personal control. He viewed all of the exhibitions before they opened to the public, and he would remove works that he didn't like. Um, he largely liked military paintings. Um, he liked the military paintings to be absolutely punctilious in the way in which they were depicted. So he would have a professor dismissed. This is true. He had a professor dismissed because he painted some military uniforms buttoned up the wrong way. The buttons were on the left instead of the right. And um, my favourite thing about Nicholas is he was also he sort of fancied himself as a little bit of a dabbler in the arts himself, and he painted little figures of soldiers into other paintings to improve them. And not just kind of second-rate paintings, which you might be forgiven for trying to improve, but actually there's some glorious examples in the Hermitage of really beautiful, incredibly precious Dutch 17th century landscape paintings with lots of little soldiers in the front that were painted in by the Tsar. So he really was, you know, he was a bit of a pest, to be honest. Um, what happened was the Academy became a very rigid institution, of course it was. These people's careers depended on staying in favour, if they were an academy professor, staying in favour with the Tsar, producing the sort of work that he liked. So some of the more innovative artists uh, travelled abroad, well, Russian artists had long travelled abroad anyway. What happened increasingly in Nicholas's reign is they didn't come back. They stayed abroad for as long as they could. And one of the great examples of this is Arest Kiprensky, another surf artist who'd also studied at the Academy and confirmed his reputation as Russia's greatest living portraitist with his unforgettable portrait of Pushkin. Now, Kipensky had travelled abroad, just come back to Russia when he got this commission, and it was a pretty gutsy thing to do. So Pushkin, by this stage, was little short of a household name. He was the most inventive and lyrical poet yet to write in Russian. He'd fallen foul of the authorities um, for his trenchant political views, and he'd been exiled for many years. Now, he'd been petitioning the Tsar and the Tsar's head of police to be allowed to return to St. Petersburg for many years. Um, he was, in the immediate period before this, he was exiled to his mother's estate, and he'd been begging and begging to be allowed back to St. Petersburg. He was allowed back, but he was kept under very, very keen surveillance. But because of his political views, which were becoming increasingly widespread, and far more so because of the brilliance of his writing, he had an extraordinary following. Everyone in the three, I suspect, knows quite how much Russians can get attached to their literary traditions. It's a fantastic thing about working out there. Um, Pushkin was the sort of figure par excellence in this respect. So, Kiprensky comes back from working abroad and gets the commission to paint him. This was a commission you really couldn't afford to mess up. But he steps up to the challenge with incredible panache. Um, one of the things he didn't do, um, which was commented on at the time, was he doesn't really recognize Pushkin's noble Ethiopian ancestry, of which the poet was very proud. But that apart, that was the only sort of negative comment that arose at the time, that that had been sort of denied. Um, what he did do was produce what, according to Pushkin's father, was the greatest ever likeness of the poet, um, with this sort of very stylish costume, the tartan, an allusion to Russia's obsession with Scottish culture and literature at this period. And unlike um, Tropkinin, who painted Pushkin, in exactly the same year, I was just checking, I've got my facts right there, um, 
uh, Kiprensi on the right avoids that stereotype of the struggling, woebegone artist. So for Trumpkinen, he's a little bit frazzled, he's a little bit disheveled, you know, he's wearing some slightly shabby sort of dressing gown thing. He's a bit like they could, you know, have a bit of an iron. Kiprensi, by contrast, shows Pushkin absolutely immaculate. He's got these pristine white collar tips. He's got disturbingly well manicured nails. <laughs> Something slightly creepy about this. Um, so I think what we, what we can see is Kiprensky having the confidence to avoid that stereotype and to portray Pushkin as this extraordinarily stylish and self, uh, sort of poised, self-aware figure. He's arrestingly stylish, I would say. And um, Pushkin himself said, I see myself as if in a mirror, but this mirror flatters me. So the, um, many of the contemporary viewers alighted on the fact I'll get away from those horrible fingernails. Um, alighted on the fact that he does look directly at the viewer. He looks into the distance as if, as if he's got some sort of glorious creative vision developing. So they saw in the portrait some indication of Pushkin's brilliant interior creative world. This portrait was not without scandal. Actually, I think that's the understatement. There's a horrible story um, attached to Kaprensky. When he'd lived in Italy, he'd had to leave very suddenly. He'd had to return to Russia very suddenly. The reason being that there was a fire in his studio and his mistress perished in that fire. And he was dogged by accusations that he'd started the fire on purpose. Now, one of the things that fueled those rumors is that he was supposed also to be having an affair with his mistress's daughter, who was still, well, we can't be sure, but was probably still a child. So there was a deeply unpleasant um, episode in his career. After he finished painting this portrait, he went back to Italy, and he didn't help put any of these rumours to rest because he then married that same daughter. So there was this very, very unpleasant scandal surrounding him. Um, unsurprisingly, he didn't stay at the top of the tree in terms of Russian society portrait commissions. Rather, it was an artist who came to attention for a very different work who acquired that laurel. Now, this was Karl Brulov, um, son of a professor at the Academy, member of a very active artistic family. His brother was an architect, another brother was a, painti a painter. Um, Brulov travelled abroad, funded by a remarkable uh, institution, an organisation called the Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, which funded many artists to travel abroad for from sort of three to six years. So, great, gen generous travelling scholarships. Um, Brulov moved abroad and he established himself there as the most famous artist of his generation with this massive history painting, um, The Last Day of Pompeii, which is, I can't quite get my perspective here, but it's, it's bigger than the wall behind me, just, it wouldn't fit into this room, just so for those of you who haven't seen it, get a sense. His sources for this vast and quite fraught painting were remarkably eclectic. He visited Pompeii in 1827 when some archaeological excavations were in full swing. So he actually went and studied the site. He was so compelled by what he saw that he determined to set his painting in the Via dei Sepulcri there. He also went to various museums where the stuff that had been excavated was being held. So he, he studied the kitchen utensils, the pots, the pans, all sorts of things that had been preserved and which you could see. Um, he, at the same time, read Pliny the Younger's account to Tacitus of the eruption of Pompeii. And so there are many classical sources for this painting, particularly um, episodes like this one where the elderly woman is imploring her son to flee. That comes straight from Pliny's account. But all of this is measured in other ways, or is balanced in other ways. So many of the poses are taken from classical sculpture, or from iterations of that in, for example, Renaissance painting or 17th century Italian painting. But it's balanced with this sort of extraordinary romantic brio. The horse that's careering up, what's the word for that? Rearing up on the right hand side. This is just a slightly closer look at that lady's head. The remarkable toppling statues. Um, you know, there's this melodrama. Um, a torsion and a melodrama in this painting which makes it quite difficult to classify. It's one of those paintings which contemporary critics 
were really confounded by it. They couldn't call it neoclassical, they couldn't call it romantic, they didn't quite know where to put it. Um, the colouring was likened to an omelette <laughs> by one of Brulov's contemporaries. You can perhaps see why, though in parts of the painting it's really very brilliant. And above all of this, we have the supreme romantic topos in the form of the artist himself. There he is, there's our man. Um, this great romantic idea that you would insert yourself into the phenomenal scene that you were painting. So there he is with his box of artistic tools running away from the flames. Now the visual impact of the last day of Pompeii was enormous. It had this incredible international um, reception. So it was shown in multiple European cities. It was like a traveling head of state. It went from academy to academy, and in each academy it was given a room of its own. It was put on display. People went and wrote about how wonderful it was, and it eventually, with enormous sort of pomp and ceremony, it returned to St. Petersburg, where there were feasts in Brulov's honor. Um, he was carried aloft on people's shoulders. They all got incredibly drunk. You know, there was vo vodka was shown, thrown at the canvas. Um, it was a brilliant, brilliant success, but it also partly paralysed Brulov. He was so um, overwhelmed by this success that while he attempted other history paintings, he never, think, well there's one he finished which is really terrible. And don't tell the Russian Museum I said that, but it is really terrible. And then there's others which he never managed to finish, and instead he ensured that his reputation doesn't stay on one work alone by moving into portrait painting. And these were very, very popular. This is one of his great celebrated portraits, um, the Lady Rider. Though a lot of viewers are mildly concerned by this, you know, this woman's astonishing poise atop this, you know, frankly alarming horse. Um, more successful, I would argue, is a painting in Washington, D.C., the portrait of the Countess Samoylova, who was an incredible figure. She'd been... Um, She'd been attracting scandal for at least the last 10 years. She was one of the great uh, society figures. She had many, many lovers in St. Petersburg. She had parties so scandalous and so licentious that the Tsar apparently threatened to demote members of the army to the navy if they went to them. So if you were in the army and you went to some Oliver's party, then it was the down downhill shoot for you. Um, because she attracted the opprobrium of the Tsar, she had to move abroad and she moved to Italy. She lived in an enormous great villa outside Milan. Um, Brulov came to know her and, like so many other men, was sort of drawn towards her, drawn towards her flame. And he paints here, I think, a really brilliant work which both establishes her noble lineage, she was very well born, and her great sort of family connections, but also hints at the way in which she doesn't conform. So in terms of the noble lineage, there's her family coat of arms just above the door here. Really unusual. You tend not to put family coats of arms above an internal door. They're largely on the outside of big houses. So this is an artifice, it's a, a construction. Um, we've also got, obviously, the splendor of her surroundings. We've got the red velvet drape, a standard motif in great noble portraits since at least the early 17th century. And yet, we've got this sort of funny little coquettish step. We've got her flinging her shawls and things at this poor black page boy. And then notably, you've got this dog whose nails are slightly tearing her silk dress. And dogs, yes, they can be a symbol of fidelity and of loyalty, but they are also a symbol of carnal desire. So Brulov is, is, I think, treading quite an unusual path here. He's making sure we note her stature and her, as I say, her glorious family line, but he's alluding to her more uh, unconformist self as well. These works were very successful, but as he continued in his portraiture, Brulov becomes, becomes much more playful in the way he brings them about. Particularly, he begins to leave bits of the canvas unfinished, which is quite remarkable for this period. Um, that's the case in his later portrait of Samoylova, where she's at a ball in St. Petersburg. But in this case, the entire canvas is unfinished, so we can't be sure that he intended to leave, in the more finished bits, patches of the canvas visible. But in his famous self-portrait, um, we can see bits of the canvas coming through the brushstroke here. So he's somebody who becomes much more adventurous in his use of paint. 
as we saw was the case with Trepinin as well. And here we've got these amazing ways. He's, he leaves the brush strokes evident in ways that parallel the fingers of the figure. It's a very sort of immersive painting. Um, at the time, he was criticised for being so aloof and seeming so proud in this portrait. In fact, he had really bad flu. Um, he was very unwell. And so one of the reasons he was painting himself is he wasn't well enough to go and have a sitting for somebody actually sitting for him. So I thought he was a little bit hard done by there. Um, these great moments of portraiture, which I've largely lingered on in the 18th and early 19th century, lay the foundation for a phenomenal portrait tradition that continued to soar in Russia from the mid-19th century onwards. That was the case in the work of the Pyridvizhniki, the astonishing realist artist who emerged in the 1870s, with works, for those of you who might know some of these figures, just to point them out, um, this is Rapin, Kramskoy, who else have we got? We've got Surikov here, glowering away, Myasayeda. Oh, and the glorious Father Christmas is Shishkin, the painter of the trees, just so you know who they are, if those are familiar names. This group of artists produce figures like, oops, sorry, going too fast, uh, Nikolai Gay here painting Leo Tolstoy um, with these extraordinary sort of craggy features and a colossal reputation intimated um, by the way in which he is quite so focused on his work. One of the paintings that we brought to London last year. Um, also work such as the portrait of Mussolski by Ilya Repin and on the right the only painting of Dostoevsky painted from life by Pierov. Um, these two were the two linchpins of the exhibition I did last year. They, you know, whenever you're doing an exhibition, you have a sort of wish list that you go to the museum or museums or owners with, and you have to have a strong case as to why you want to borrow them. Um, particularly museums won't just lend a painting because you say, oh, but I really like it, it'll look good. You have to have a, a story, a, a kind of case. And these were the sort of crux of my case. And I thought particularly that Dostoevsky was going to be very, very hard to borrow because um, it is the only image of him from life. And amazingly, for Tretyakov, um, we ended up having five visits to discuss the sort of exhibition and how it would take shape, and they largely confirmed that we could have it in the first um, visit, which was really great. I sort of thought, yeah, game on, bear with me here. Um, the painting of Mussorgsky, of course, famous for being one which Rapin painted when Mussorgsky was ravaged by alcohol and had been hospitalised. Um, Rapin was sent by Tretyakov, the great collector, on the overnight train from Moscow to St. Petersburg to paint him, and they holed up for three days, in, in fact, the three days immediately after the assassination of the Tsar, who'd been blown up in a bomb blast in St. Petersburg. So they holed up in this hospital ward with Mussorgsky in his hospital gown with Rapin painting. And Rapin left after three days, hoping to return for a final sitting, but Mussorgsky died just 11 days later having been smuggled in a bottle of cognac by a, a particularly doting nurse mm -hmm. who didn't do him any favours. Um, I think this, I mean this, I'm sometimes asked what, you know, desert island paintings, we sad art historians, we paint things like desert island paintings, which would be your eight desert island paintings. Um, this would be one of mine, I think it's an incredible picture, and it gets across this extraordinary energy of the inter-arts at the time. There were mesmerising portraits of women as well. Again, two which we brought over last year for uh, Russia and the Arts. On the right, Anna Akhmatova, on the front of the cover, by, yes, a woman artist at last, Olga de la Voskadovskaya. And on the left, our unforgettable poster girl. Um, I've just been told by the MPG, actually, they kept the massive poster that they had hanging outside the door for me to take home. So I'm about to, I don't know, hang it on my house. Um, <laughs> my husband's looking worried in the back row. Um, but there she is. And she caused me enormous grief when she came to London because she's big, as any of you who saw the exhibition will know. And the place we designated for her was over an air vent, which had never been a problem before. But the, curi the couriers, the Russian couriers who brought the painting over, said, uh -uh, you can't hang her over an air vent. Um, the painting's not backed very well, and they thought it would cause damage. And there was this comedy afternoon when we all tore our hair out, and we tried all these different arrangements, and it ruined all of the connections I've been trying to make, until a bright spark said, but we could cover the air vent. And that's what we did. And when Fraser, the handyman in the National Portrait Gallery, arrived to do that, I was very pleased to see that he was dressed for the event. There he is. <laughs> that was not staged. He walked in wearing those clothes. As the century came to an end, and you'll be glad to know as my lecture comes to an end, 
these extraordinary traditions expanded further still to bring, whoa, what did I do there? To bring in a great impressionist strand uh, here in the work of Rapin. Rapin so often thought of for his monumental dramatic realist scenes, but a consummate impressionist artist as well. In the work of Sirov, here his portrait of Rimsky Korsakov in London last year, and the less formal and utterly beautiful portrait of Mika Marozov as a child. And towards the end of the century, this extraordinary fragmentation of plane, of line, and of shape in the work of Mikhail Vrubel, who anticipated Cubism by more than a decade, driving home my point that Russian art is not derivative. In some ways, it led the way. These artists would stick their heads above the parapet higher and higher and dazzle global audiences as never before. They're the artists who we've become more familiar with and they eventually paved the way for the avant-garde. But they stood on the shoulders of their predecessors, the people who I look at in my book, who had doggedly developed and promoted the capabilities of Russian artists and developed what I hope I've shown to be this incredible web, a very complex web, of personalities and portrait and painting traditions that Russia quite rightly is proud to call its own. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Polly. It was a great privilege to hear the fruits of your research, which are absolutely remarkable. And this area, which is a closed door for so many of us in the West, has been open thanks to your research. And it's an incredible achievement, and I have to say that our jewellery, when discussing the shortlist, we're all totally overexcited about this book. And the shortlist is about new research as much as good writing, and, and, and that's why it's on the shortlist. So, so it was wonderful to hear firsthand, delivered so, with such a aplomb, um, th this talk. And I wanted to ask, you know, you're, you're overturning some of the prejudices of the Soviet period in, in your work. Um, what, what about perceptions of within Russia? Um, what, what are perceptions at the moment? What, was that work necessary there too among, among Russian academics? And how do they see the role of your work? I'll just open up the questions with, with, sure, with sure. that. Thank you, Clem. I mean, that, that's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's not always straightforward, I think, um, in any sense, but particularly in Russia. If you're a non-Russian working on Russian painting, it's not straightforward because obviously, my Russian colleagues, um, to whom I'm absolutely indebted, they handle these paintings. My colleagues in the museums, they handle them, they turn them over, their, you know, their familiarity with them will always be greater than what mine can be. So I spend a lot of time there, but I'm not living with them every day. Um, what I've been really delighted about is they, um, they really welcome the book, which has been lovely. And um, I think there are two reasons for that. One is that they say nobody's ever thought about the sort of the profession of artists. So a lot of Russian art history is still very laudatory and it's very monographic in the sense of there'll be a biography of Rapin or a biography of Sirov or whatever it is, or a book on landscape painting and a book on genre painting. And they look very much at, um, they, they, they don't necessarily look through things with the critical prism that we might bring. And by that I don't mean at all that they are uncritical or that I rip my artists to shreds but I will happily talk about bad paintings because I'm interested in the whole sort of gamut of what it was to be a painter in Russia, not just in the great sort of canonical figures. Um, and the other thing which I, uh, I've been really gratified by is they get what this sort of big thrust of my book, trying to make Russia part of the big European picture, not to make it, not to force it, you know, not to force a sort of square peg into a round hole, but trying to recover that sense in the 18th and 19th century of this enormous community of artists who traveled and met each other and discussed stuff and then they fell out and then they sort of you know became friends again and um, you get people like uh, Levitsky who is familiar with the work of Reynolds in Britain because there's a big circulating print tra trade of Reynolds's work and it was those sort of conversations that I was really keen to recover um, and as I ended with my note about Frugal also to get the point across that Russia wasn't always playing catch-up, which is the conventional, the sort of received wisdom that, oh, she doesn't get a, an academy until 1757, and then over 100 years, she's desperately trying to catch up with what people in the West were doing. Well, actually, she had an academy 11 years before we did. 
So it's not, you know, that, that whole model has to be overturned. Any other questions? No, I think you've all been heated to sleep. Thank you. <laughs> Nuts and bolts, and what, what sort of paint did you use? What sort of brushes? Whether it's different from you know what painters in France or Germany or, or England were using. I mean, there is still I mean, uh, some sort of visible difference that you see right away when you look at a Russian, uh, a Russian um, uh, painting. And I'm wondering whether that's you know the quality of the material they were using, or yeah. like that. I think initially the quality of the material they were using was really bad, and uh, they didn't have access to some of the resources which. Um, professors and students in another academy might take for granted. So there's a lovely story of a German professor of anatomy who was recruited at considerable expense. These foreign professors were paid way more than the going rate to try and persuade him to go and work in Russia. So he was recruited at great expense um, and he went to St. Petersburg and he got to the academy and he spent three years waiting for a skeleton to arrive and then he gave up and went home again. So they, you know, they were very frustrated at times. The quality of the paint in the 18th century, this is, um, wasn't as good as in some other centres. But gradually that changes. By about the 1790s, there's a pretty sort of thriving trade in those sort of materials. One of the things that um, I think is a key difference in many of the early works is background. And I think this comes from the icon tradition. Uh, for a long time, the sense of sort of spatial recession and depth is far less developed than it is in comparable Western artists. Um, partly because if you were good at that in Russia, you were instantly nicked to work for the theatres and to produce theatre designs. So there was a kind of competition there. They were assigned to go and work for the theatres. But I think also partly because they came from a tradition where there was a flatness of space in the background. It took a long time to overcome that. So Levitsky's, um, for those of you who know them, his famous portraits of the Smolny Institute girls. Um, they're incredibly accomplished, um, but the backgrounds are very sort of one-dimensional, and that's not because he was a bad artist. He, you know, we know he was good enough to do that sort of thing, but there was a kind of resistance to doing it. Any other questions? Yes. One of the extraordinary things in the early 20th century was the emergence of women artists. Yeah. And <coughs> which one, one you have on the screen here? Yes. Um, Escher and what I saw and other. What about the period of your study? I mean, yeah. do they, how, did they just suddenly emerge in the other No, they, they, they cause, they, they're there. Uh, they caused me great grief when I was, as a couple of people here know, I, I, when I was trying to structure the book, I agonized. What I've ended up doing is having a chapter on them at the end of the book, which goes against all of my <laughs> feminist credentials to have them sort of hived off and parked at the end of the book in a chapter. But the problem was, while they were there, and some of them were absolutely extraordinary, there were so few of them that to deal with them in the overall chronology risked losing quite how remarkable they were when they were emerging. So, um, but the, the straightforward answer to your question is they, they were women artists. Um, they couldn't study at the academy until 1873. They were admitted as sort of fully-fledged matriculated <coughs> students. Before that, they could come as sort of auditors and sit in on a class. Um, but what the Academy did, which again shows that it was more progressive than people might think, was at a really early stage, I think the first one was in the 1820s, women artists could submit work and they would be given a, a particular certificate or title or award for that. So there were ways in which they could build up um, a kind of portfolio of recognition for what they did. Um, and the first woman artist to win the gold medal, which was the absolute top medal that the Academy Awarded was in 1854, so again much earlier than was the case in Britain. Um, actually, she, I mean, she wasn't a very good artist as far as I can tell, so there might have been a bit of a tokenism there, but nonetheless they were prepared to look at and consider women's work. It really takes off in the um, 1880s, I would say. They start, so yeah, the decade after they're allowed to train at the Academy is when we first see really accomplished women artists. So people like um, Alina Palinova, who was the sister of Palina, she's an extraordinary artist. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, I've heard about the other sort of group of um, art studios, like the Stroganoff um, yeah. art studio. How did that relate to the the, the period I look at, they're incredibly few for a very long time. So in the first half, so there's, in 1780, there's a sort of half-hearted attempt to set up a provincial art school, but it dies a death. 
And then the first um, really significant ones are in the early 19th century. But they largely needed the academy's support if they were to flourish, because they needed the sort of resources which it was very difficult to get hold of otherwise. And there was only a handful that the academy did support. So you ended up with this incredible centralised system right through to the middle of the 19th century, where you had the academy as the mothership and then just sort of five or six little satellites um, floating around. And they, one of the things that I was amazed at is they had nothing to do with each other. It was almost as if they, you know, so they would uh, communicate with the academy, which could be hundreds and hundreds of miles away. But in one case, two of these art schools weren't that far apart. And there were two in Kiev, which overlapped. Absolutely no connection between them at all. It was almost as if, you know, like sort of foreigners abroad who don't want to talk to each other because they're sort of embarrassed to be seen. They, they didn't have any connection at all. So it was very centralised. There was a, a very extraordinary one in Azamas run by a man called Stupin, which functioned for some years. But the others were... Um, I look at them in the book, and they do some things which are unusual, but you don't have any sort of federated system. You don't have the, the system that you had in France at this time where there's a real push to get more provincial art schools going. Also, uh, have a look at um, the beginning of the 20th century and Russian symbolist art. No, I don't. And its connections with the symbolist <laughs> arts and works, which is quite interesting. They're very interesting, but one of the things I was adamant I was going to do is I was going to stop before all of that stuff. Because there's bit dope stuff that makes it sound. I think it's amazing. But what I wanted to do was keep the focus on this period that has been neglected. Um, so initially I was going to stop the book in 1873, uh, which was when Rapin finished painting Barge Rollers on the Volga, and it was exhibited at the um, International Exhibition in Vienna, and he won an enormous medal for that. And I thought that was a good finishing point. And then my Russian colleagues just went, what are you doing? That, that's ridiculous. They didn't like that at all. Um, and so then I tested with them the idea of going to 1881, which was even better because you get the enormous explosion of the poor old Tsar being blown up and things change so dramatically in how civic life is organised after that and how, how social life is organised. And um, my Russian colleagues were much happier with that, mm -hmm. which isn't that I count out of them, but they just said it's, you'll miss so much if you stop in 1873, which is true. I was going to miss miss out realism so but what I always wanted to do was make sure that I didn't want this period to be treated in the book as a prelude to oh and then the great stuff happens so I decided just not to look at the period that's been addressed so much more yeah is there an English point of view of Japan or did you have to track down the detail of the piece as well uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's biographies in Russia, in Russian, there's no biography of him. Is there any biography in English? I mean, he's talked about in some of the overarching um, English survey books. I don't think there's a biography of him in English. A lot of this was in the, um, in fact, the, I wasn't the person who discovered he was a pastry maker, but I found more about that in the Academy archives, um, which are extraordinary, because it's, it's had this continuous history and they're largely very well preserved. You can, you know, there's some really remarkable documents in there. Hard to read though, not, not good. Yes? How, how did literature treat artists? How did literature treat artists? During this period, I've been a man of uh, uh, it's about yes. the price to pay for the yeah. success. Yeah, yeah. It's a brilliant story. It's about yeah. alcohol again. Yes. There's a lot. There's a lot of interaction between them, especially from the, you know, the 1840s and the, the natural school, as Belinsky termed it, um, the work of Gogol, Dostoevsky, all of that onwards. There's a there are a lot of appearances of artists and artistic scenarios in literature. The Anna Karenina one is, is probably the most celebrated. Um, conversely, as well, many of the not actually the, many, not many, some of the artists I look at in the book. Uh, worked as illustrators, uh, so there's a kind of healthy dialogue between the two. It's one of the reasons that the exhibition last year we called Russia and the Arts, because it was, uh, although it's in not this period, it's the later period, it goes from about 1870 up to the First World War um, and the catalogue for that, but it was to bring, bring out that incredible dialogue and the connections between the different art forms. Any other questions? No, right. I think you might be about to die of heat. Thank you very much indeed for your patience.